Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church. This, of course, is the show where we sort through the flotsam and jetsam of the last week on the Vatican Beat, picking out those few nuggets of gold that you need to have in your hot little hands. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with transition for transsexuals. The Vatican issues a cautious and heavily nuanced yes to the questions of whether transsexuals can be baptized, can serve as godparents, can have their own children baptized, and can serve as witnesses in church weddings. We'll explain why the Vatican spoke now and why, in a very real sense, it is a classic instance of a bold and arguably courageous stance that leaves absolutely no one fully satisfied. Second, we've got So Long Strickland, a, a fond farewell to Bishop Joseph Strickland of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas, who was removed this past week by Pope Francis after having done, well, pretty much everything other than explicitly accusing the Pope in public of being a heretic, we'll explain what happened and what the potential fallout of it all might be. Third, now we have papal power. Why the Vatican's long-running, two and a half years in the making, trial of the century, which is lumbering towards an expected verdict in the middle of next month, in some ways is boiling down to an answer to a seemingly very simple but actually highly fraught question, to wit, is the Pope above the law? We'll explain why that's the issue and what the potential consequences of it all might be. Finally, this week, we have damnatio memoriae, that famous Roman phrase, the damnation of memory, and how it applies to a little-known footnote to American-Vatican relations regarding a carefully excised American role in the first-ever filming of a pope over concerns from the Vatican about American, well, lasciviousness. We'll bring all that to you and more on this week's episode, so please stay where you are. We will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial, because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So. Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. (laughs) 
All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday on the 14th of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. As ever in the Pope Francis ever, as ever in the Pope Francis era, there is never a dull moment on the Vatican beat. We've got a jam-packed schedule for you for you this week, so let's get started. We begin with transition for transsexuals. As I mentioned at the top of the show, the Vatican's Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, historically known as the Holy Office, this past week issued a response to a set of six dubia, or theological doubts, which were submitted by a bishop from Brazil, which concerned transsexual individuals. The questions had to do with whether transsexuals could, could be validly baptized, whether they could serve as godparents to other children, whether they could have their own children baptized, and whether they could serve as witnesses to church weddings. And in absolutely every instance, the Dicastery for the Faith issued what amounts to a kind of yellow light that is a very cautious yes. Basically, what the Dicastery said is that in response to each one of those questions, it left the judgment in the hands of local pastors and the local bishops saying that transsexual persons, yes, they can be baptized, yes, they can be godparents, yes, they can have their own children baptized, yes, they can be witnesses in church weddings, but in every instance, they were very careful to say that this can only be done if there is no risk of what they described as public scandal or confusion about church teaching on the sacrament of marriage. Now, they did not define what might constitute public scandal or confusion. And so in the eyes of many observers, what all this does is really sort of ratify what was already the status quo. And the status quo in the Catholic Church was basically that there are some bishops, some pastors, who were willing, sort of quietly and without a great deal of fanfare, to permit transsexual individuals to do all of these things. There were other bishops and pastors concerned about the integrity of Catholic teaching on marriage and human sexuality who were not willing to do that. And there's frankly very little about this new ruling from the Vatican that would force either side in that contest to change their positions. Now, this ruling from the Vatican was welcomed in a kind of guarded way by advocates for transsexual and LGBTQ plus Catholics who said that, for example, New Ways Ministries in the United States, which said that it recognizes or sort of ratifies that the more pastoral approach that Pope Francis is, has been trying to take to this constituency is to some extent taking hold in the Catholic Church. They also saw it as a kind of indirect response to a position taken by the American bishops earlier this year who had said that the use of chemical or surgical measures to reverse someone's sexuality were inappropriate, asking Catholic hospitals not to perform these procedures. And advocates for that community also saw it as a reversal of an earlier position taken by the Vatican itself, by the doctrinal, well, what is now the doctrinal dicastery, what was in 2015 still the doctrinal congregation, in response to another dubia submitted to it by a bishop in Spain who had asked if transsexuals could be gone parents. At that point in 2015, the Holy Office said no. Remember that at that stage, the congregation was still under the leadership of German Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, widely seen as more conservative than the current cardinal prefect of the dicastery, Argentinian Cardinal Victor Fernandez. In 2015, the answer was no. Today, the answer is a kind of cautious yes. So all of that has been welcomed. On the other hand, 
The statement from New Way's ministry also said they continued to be disappointed with what the Vatican had to say because, in their view, it continued to represent a limited understanding of the nature of marriage. Basically, that the Vatican continues to insist that marriage is a relationship between a man and a woman, and that therefore anything that would court confusion about the nature of marriage should not be pursued. You know, on the other hand, it is a, it is a decision that has also been criticized by many conservatives and traditionalists in the Catholic fold who believe that it does, in fact, court confusion about the nature of marriage, and it courts confusion about Catholic teaching about human sexuality. You know, what all this reminds me of is the inherent difficulty of trying to be a reforming pope in the Catholic Church. I'm reminded of a famous remark from Pope John the Twenty-Third, now Saint John the Twenty-Third, another reforming pope, of course, the pope who called the Second Vatican Council in the mid-1960s. John the Twenty-Third once famously said that he had to be pope both for those with their foot on the gas and those with their foot on the brake. That is, he had to try to take the concerns of both progressives and also conservatives and traditionalists into consideration. Now, you know, that is, on the one hand, a tremendous statement about unity, right? You know, trying to keep everybody, trying to be open to the concerns of everybody in the Catholic fold. On the other hand, it is also a recipe for making nobody really happy. Because what's going to happen is that progressives will applaud your intent, but not your execution. Conservatives will criticize your execution, if not necessarily your intent. And that is kind of where Pope Francis and Cardinal Fernandez find themselves right now with this new ruling on transsexuals. Anyway, bottom line, is the Vatican has said that it is up to local pastors and local bishops to make these determinations. It will, of course, be interesting to see how this plays out as things go forward. All right, second up this week, we've got so long, Bishop Strickland. Bishop Joseph Strickland of the pretty small, frankly, Diocese of Tyler, Texas, has long been a kind of premier thorn in the side of this papacy. He is extraordinarily active on social media, particularly, <laughs> I always love this, the, the social media platform previously known as Twitter. To me, this makes Twitter like Prince, right? We used to have to say the artist formerly known as Prince. Now we say the platform formerly known as Twitter, now known as X for reasons that surpass all understanding. But in any event, on Twitter and on other social media platforms, Bishop Strickland has been a kind of frequent critic of Pope Francis. He at one point suggested in a social media post that the Pope was compromising the deposit of faith. More recently, on October 31st, in a, a kind of wrap-up of the Pope's Synod of Bishops on Synodality in Rome, which ran from the 4th to the 29th of October, Bishop Strickland suggested that this had not been a particularly helpful exercise in the life of the Church. He quoted at length from a letter he said he had received from a dear friend describing Pope Francis as a usurper who illegitimately set on the throne of Peter and, you know, is doing various bad things in terms of where the church is going. Without ever having directly used the H word, that is heresy, you know, most people would, I think, conclude that Bishop Strickland was, has been suggesting for some time that Pope Francis is trafficking in heresy. Now, there was a Vatican decreed apostolic visitation of the Diocese of Tyler in the wake of all of this. And in addition to concerns about the bishop's public criticism of the Pope, according to various reports, 
This visitation also surfaced other concerns having to do with administration and management of the diocese. For one thing, there has been a kind, well, a remarkable degree of turnover in staff for a diocese that is as small as Tyler is. And in addition, there are also concerns about the bishop's, what, sponsorship, endorsement, for the creation of an intentional Catholic community within his diocese in the small Texas locale of Winona, which was within the the boundaries of the Diocese of Tyler, a place that is known as Veritatis Splendor, a reference to the encyclical of John Paul II about the splendor of the truth. This thing was announced to great fanfare in 2000, Then in 2021, there was a kind of scandal in which one of the founders was revealed to have been in an adulterous relationship with a leader in a Texas pro-life group, and this caused, you know, any number of problems. There is concern about diversion of diocesan finances, and so forth and so on. Anyway, point is, at the end of the day, a decision was made that basically Bishop Strickland had to go. Now, according to a statement that was issued by Cardinal Daniel DiNardo of Houston in Texas, and full disclosure, Cardinal DiNardo is a friend of my wife and I, but in any event, Cardinal DiNardo announced that Bishop Strickland had been asked to resign, but on November 9th, it was made clear that Bishop Strickland was not willing to voluntarily You know, he was not willing to go quietly into that good night. And so on November 11th, it was announced that he had been removed. Now, you know, the obvious question that is posed by all of this is, okay, what does Bishop Strickland do next? Because let's be clear, he has not been removed as a bishop. He remains a bishop in good standing in the Catholic Church. He is simply no longer the ordinary of the Diocese of Tyler. And so, Okay, what's the next act? Now, Bishop Strickland gave an interview to LifeSite News, widely regarded as one of the more, oh, what, hard right conservative media outlets in the Catholic universe, in which he basically said he doesn't quite know what the next act is going to be. Remember, F. Scott Fitzgerald famously said, there are no second acts in American life, a claim that has been repeatedly disproved. I mean, look at Donald Trump, right? And it is likely the case that Bishop Strickland will also be, you know, the exception that proves the rule. He has indicated that his calendar is now suddenly free, but expects it will be pretty rapidly filled up. Now, you know, what to make of all of this? Well, look, critics of Pope Francis will seize on this as another instance of him being, you know, what he was memorably described in a very critical book as being a dictator pope. That is, somebody who does not brook opposition or criticism, who actually punishes people, who dare to raise critical questions about his administration. Further, You know, critics will say this is an instance of a bishop who was trying to courageously defend the truth of Catholic teaching, who, you know, was jettisoned by the Pope in a kind of, what, pettily vindictive act. Now, on the other hand, you know, supporters of the Pope are going to say, okay, historically, name the Pope who would just blithely sit around while one of his bishops ran around calling him a heretic and a bad guy. And further would say that there were some other issues in the Diocese of Tyler that needed attention. And that, you know, fundamentally, they would argue that Strickland painted the Pope into a corner. They would say he was repeatedly given opportunities to try to back down to try to make peace and just stubbornly refused to do so. You know, the real question, I suppose, that all of this presents is, in the end, is this going to be an illustration of that old wisdom of keep your friends close and your enemies closer? I mean, will Pope, will Francis and the Vatican end up regretting 
sort of, you know, throwing Strickland out into the atmosphere where he is now free, utterly unencumbered by any administrative responsibilities uh, to say kind of whatever he wants to say and to kind of develop a roving ministry as the de facto Episcopal chaplain to the opposition to this papacy. I mean, I would point out that as of this filming, Strickland has a Twitter, well, sorry, an X following of around 162,000 people, I think it is, which, by the way, is about 40,000 more than the population of the Diocese of Tyler itself. You know, we will see whether he continues to build upon that platform and continues to bang the drum in terms of criticism of the Francis papacy and, you know, what kind of following credibility he will have going forward. In any event, you know, to quote Richard Nixon, it would appear that Pope Francis will not have Bishop Strickland to kick around anymore. All right, third up this week, we've got papal power. So, the Vatican's, what I have called, the Vatican's trial of the century. And by the way, I want to note that there are those who object to my use of that vocabulary. A well-known Italian priest has said that I'm an idiot for calling it that. He has said it is not the trial of the century. It is actually a farce from the 19th century, to which my response would be, okay, what other Vatican criminal trial would you propose? actually ought to be called the trial of the century, because frankly, there haven't been any. Whatever. Point is, this high-profile legal process that was initiated two and a half years ago against 10 defendants, uh, including for the very first time a cardinal, Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, is currently, in kind of slow-motion fashion, moving towards its endgame. This month, the month of November, we are hearing the final closing arguments of defense attorneys. But note, do you know what the Italians call a closing argument in a criminal trial? The word is aringa, which translates into English as harangue. I just love that. The lawyers are giving their final harangues this month. And then Early next month, the prosecutor in the case, Italian law, uh, lawyer Alessandro Didi, will give his closing harangue. And then somewhere around December 16th, we expect a verdict. Now, you know, at one level, the question here, obviously, is pretty basic. That is, did these 10 defendants actually steal money from the Vatican? Did they engage in embezzlement, fraud, misrepresentation, the various things they've been charged with? However, this past week, one of the defense attorneys, veteran Italian lawyer and jurist Luigi Panella, who was representing a guy by the name of Enrico Crasso, who is a longtime financial consultant to the Vatican Secretary of State, framed the argument a different way. In addition to rejecting the specific charges against his client, he also said that this case raises issues about the limits of papal power. He pointed to four waivers from existing law that Pope Francis granted at the beginning of this process between 2000, basically July 2019 and February 2020. These waivers are technically known as rescripts. There were four of them. And basically what they did is that they gave the prosecutor in this case, again, Alessandro Didi, the power to engage in all kinds of wiretaps and confiscation of documents, also physical sequestration of persons and assets that had no basis in existing Vatican penal law. But the Pope said, go for it, you can do it. And it was on the basis of those rescripts that Diddy was able to put together the elements of this prosecution. Now, basically, Pinella's argument was that if those rescripts are allowed to stand, what they essentially do is carry the Catholic Church all the way back to the year 1075, when Pope Gregory VII issued a collection of assertions of absolute, sweeping, unfettered, 
papal authority called dictatus pape, uh, the dictates of the pope. And Pinella's argument was that that kind of absolute conception of papal monarchy may have been appropriate to the 11th century, but it's not appropriate today. Basically, he argued that modern popes have repeatedly said that the Catholic Church has to be a society of law. The rule of law has to apply to the church just as much as it does to the outside world. Pinella also noted that modern popes have signed off on various international conventions and treaties, such as the European Convention on Human Rights, which has provisions about due process and criminal prosecutions. In other words, he said, modern popes have accepted that they are no longer absolute monarchs that there are limits on their authority imposed by laws that they themselves have either emanated or ratified. And Pinella has basically said that these rescripts that Pope Francis issued, that, which, by the way, he noted, were never actually published by the Vatican, and therefore they were never given the force of law. He said they have to be subject to more basic Vatican law, which is the fundamental law of the Vatican City State and also the Code of Canon Law. And basically, he told the judges in this case that if you want to be men of the law, if you want to uphold the rule of law, then your responsibility is to reject these rescripts because they are subordinate to the laws that you are, in, you are obligated to uphold. And he said, you've got to throw this entire prosecution out and you've got to start over. Now, look. At the beginning of the trial, the three-judge panel overseeing this case rejected those objections. I don't know that there's any serious basis to believe that they're now going to revisit that decision. But what this illustrates is that in many ways, this trial, in, not maybe in terms of the verdict that these judges are going to issue, but at least in terms of the court of public opinion, shapes up as a referendum on papal power. All right, finally, this week. We've got Damnatio Memoriae. Turned out this week, the Vatican had to come clean. Basically, it has to do with the first time a pope was ever captured on film. This was Pope Leo XIII in 1896. It has long been believed that it was an Italian pioneer of the cinema who recorded those images. In fact, the Vatican acknowledged this week that it was actually an American who recorded the images, which can be found online. If you Google Leo the 13th film YouTube, you will find them. But that the Vatican had buried this history and basically disavowed its relation with this early American filmmaker because it turned out these images of Leo the 13th were being shown in America at county fairs where, in addition, there were also other short films being shown of a decidedly raunchier nature because, let's face it, folks, the birth of the cinema and the birth of porno films occurred at exactly the same moment. And the concern was, you know what? Showing videos of the Pope alongside scantily clad women in obviously seductive scenarios they felt at the time that wasn't exactly consonant with the dignity of the papacy. They had at one point apparently considered suing this American filmmaker, but instead decided basically just to disavow him and to instead create the impression that it had been an Italian who did it. An Italian historian this week published a new book, Setting the Record Straight. It creates you know, an interesting footnote to the story of U.S.-Vatican relations. And finally, this actually French-born British-American filmmaker who was working for an American company at the time finally is getting the credit that is due. All right, that's our show for this week. Before I wrap up, two quick footnotes. One, my wife Elise and I are leaving tomorrow for a couple of weeks in the States, visiting our family in Denver, Colorado. We will continue to bring the show to you, but I want to apologize in advance if there are any compromises in audio or visual quality that will be necessary to make that possible. Second, 
I also want to say that this past Saturday, November 11th, was a very important anniversary for me. It was one year ago, November 11th, 2022, that after 25 long days in Rome's Spallanzani Hospital, I was finally able to return home after a very serious, potentially life-threatening surgery on my esophagus. Many of you who watched this show reached out during that time to express your support and your prayers. I want you to know that my wife and I will never be finished being grateful for the love and support you showed us during that period. Thank you. All right. You can find full coverage of all the stories we have talked about on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will talk to you again very soon.